This afternoon's sermon will pertain to the divine role of women. If you would, and we'll get to it a little later, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15. There's always a need to study anything the Bible teaches regarding anything. Some things might be more important at certain times than others. But I do not know of a greater subject in view of our present day culture and society and the state the church church is in than to what the Bible teaches concerning the role of women. In fact, what the Bible teaches on the matter sounds more foreign all the time in view of how far people are departing from the Bible in general, and the New Testament in particular, from the role it teaches for women. But that doesn't change God and what His will says because He has assigned certain roles for men and certain roles for women. Now, you might say, well, the women are the only one who need to hear this. Well, if that's your viewpoint, then uh, you probably hear it, need to hear it more than the women. I like to think any time we would be studying something like this on the divine role of women, that the men need to be hearing it as much as anybody else because when they recognize what God expects out of a woman, the wife, and the mother in uh, this world, it ought to make them recognize the role God has assigned them in working with the wife, the mother, the woman, and to understand the why of her creation. I want to say that it ought to be taught a whole lot more than from a pulpit like this or from a Bible class as we have in the building. The place where the role of women and the role of men, wives, husbands, mothers, fathers, must be taught. If it is to withstand the onslaught of the devil working in every way he can to get us away from our roles, it must be taught by mothers in the home. And fathers are charged with rearing their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And, of course, the mothers are to guide the household. And part of that in doing their duty as mothers is to teach their little girls about their role in life. Do you think much of that's going on nowadays? Same thing's true when it comes to little boys. So it's important to discuss the role that God has assigned women. And you might realize that it's such an important thing, an important role in our society, in the home, and in the church. Notice this, just to, to survey a moment, what the Bible has to say about women, and I'll just be reading some facts of the matter, such as in Luke 8, 3, how the women ministered to the Lord in His earthly ministry of their own substance. In Acts 9, 36, you remember uh, Dorcas, now after she had died, it was the widows who showed all the garments, uh, various things she had made for them. And it shows the attitude, the disposition of mind that Dorcas had toward her work as a, as a woman and the role that she had. And when you look at Aquila and Priscilla, you see a husband-wife team. And they took a very eloquent Apollos aside and taught him the way of the Lord more perfectly, Acts 18, 26. I do want to pause here, and we'll say more about this later, that it says, Aquila and Priscilla taught. I have dealt with brethren some years ago who, when I used this and said, I know what a conjunction is. It means that what Aquila was doing was what Priscilla was doing, and what Priscilla was doing was what Aquila was doing, and they taught Apollos the way of the Lord more perfectly, which means she had a hand in teaching a man. But I can guarantee you this, she didn't teach in such a way as to exercise dominion over her husband or Apollos. 
And that's something that we need to understand. So that tells me that a woman merely teaching doesn't, by the teaching alone, exercise dominion over a man. It's how she goes about things. It's where she is. And we'll talk about that, as I say, a little more later in the lesson. As you read about Paul, you see that on repeated occasions, Paul spoke of the church, and he spoke of the church in the house, meeting in the house of Aquil and Priscilla, 1 Corinthians 16, 19, and Romans chapter 16, verses 3 and 4. The woman Phoebe is mentioned as a servant of the church in Sincrea, Romans 16, 1 and verse 2. Many people have read that. See, they had women deacons in the church. Well, the Greek word diakonos is simply a word for servant. And any woman doing anything as a Christian under the authority of Christ is a servant of the church. So it doesn't prove there was an office of deacons. And you take the totality of the Bible on deacons, and you see that for men there are qualifications to be met to fulfill that. But everything we do, as far as the church is concerned in serving Christ faithfully in it, is makes us servants of the church. And Phoebe was. Evidently, it caught Paul's attention as to her dedication and work in the church in Sincrea. And the Holy Spirit had him include her name, even, in Romans 16, 1 and 2. We find from Romans chapter 16, verse 6, that there was a woman by the name of Mary who worked among the Romans. I don't know what she was doing, but uh, she was working among them. And in Romans 16, 12, Tryphena and Tryphosa labored in the Lord. So I know that in beginning to look at the divine role of women, that uh, when you see the scripture mentioning these, they were doing what was right before the Lord in the church. Don't know what all it was involved, but I know it was not out of harmony with the teaching of Christ concerning the role of women. I would say in my lifetime and listening to older preachers, especially going back toward the early 20th century and listening to those preachers who were young men then and older preachers, they would talk about how the, if it hadn't been for certain women in certain places, the church would have folded. And it was two women sisters who really helped this church get going and stand behind it many, many, many years ago. So women have been in a serious place of work and doing service to the Lord. Sometimes uh, women are uh, characterize a, a greater spirituality, interested in spiritual things more than men do, and the church has started many times with them. You can certainly see that uh, Timothy's grandmother and mother were the keys to his knowledge of God's word and the faith that was in him that was derived therefrom. Well, the same is true of the home as it's revealed on the pages of the Bible. Now, we all recognize that the denominational world in general, and to one extent or the other, has rejected the authority of the Bible as the only rule of faith and practice in all religious and for that matter even moral matters they hold closer to it in some ways or in some churches they do in others but none of them follow it as they ought and certainly when it comes down to the role of women they don't follow what it teaches you've got among a number of groups today women doing the very same thing elders and preachers do in the church and they're exercising dominion over men right and left. You never know what you're going to get when you ask somebody in a denomination what anything is because they don't know their Bible. Uh, to think that they knew their Bible is ridiculous because if they really knew it, they wouldn't be in denominations. And sadly, there are some members of the Lord's church have done too much listening to what's on television or, you know, you become an authority and get your Facebook page and publish anything on there. So every harebrained in the world can post anything on Facebook or somewhere 
and give them a real pretty background and uh, put on a suit or whatever they put on. Some of them need to put on a suit. But uh, they become an authority. It's sort of like writing a book. If you can write a book and publish it, man, look what you are. You must know everything there is to know about that subject and can't be contradicted. Well, that's a bunch of monarchy. And every Tom, Dick, and Harry goat and monkey is on Facebook. I think a lot more goats and monkeys than there are Tom, Dick, and Harry. Various brethren of the looser variety doctrinally have permitted women to be in positions of work in the church where women have exercised authority or dominion over men. And that's just to sum it all up if you go away from anything else. That's what the Bible does not allow in the role of women. It just doesn't. So it's critical for us to understand what the Bible teaches concerning women's role in the church. <coughs> now, what I'm about to say is totally, in politi totally politically un incorrect. It uh, makes people mad. That doesn't mean it had not ought to be said and emphasized because it is divine authority, by divine authority. Let me emphasize, not my authority or any other human being's authority, but it's by divine authority that women are subordinate to men. Now that word subordinate is just like a, waving a, a red flag in front of a very angry bull when it comes to some people. Because we don't like to think we're subordinate to anybody. Well, try that in the military. <laughs> try that in the military. There is such a thing as insubordination. I don't think it's left our language. And it all goes along with the idea of authority. Of, as long as there's authority, and Jesus has all of it, and he's manifested in the words of the New Testament, then to not submit to that authority is to be in a state of insubordination. Listen to what the Holy Spirit through Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus with what I've just said in mind. In Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, Paul wrote, Wives, need I define that? Do I need to go into the Greek and spend an hour explaining to people what wives are? Wives, that next word's going to get us. But it'll be their reading and meaning on the day of judgment, what it reads, how it reads and means now. Wives, Submit yourselves unto your own husband. Not somebody else's husband. That seems to be the thing nowadays if they believe in husbands at all. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. With what kind of state of mind? Well, I got to. I must. I grudgingly do it. No, it says as unto the Lord. Now, before ever arrive, people arrive up and you want to stone me with psalm books or something, this is God's Word. It was written for our instruction. Now, I said this had application to the men. Don't men need to understand what that means regarding what they expect out of their wives when she's under this kind of direction to be in submission to her own husband? That should tell us why men are as husbands are taught to consider her as the weaker vessel and to make rulings, if you please, having the final say so, so regarding her own needs and the role God assigned her as well as the children, and they work together. The husband is the head of the wife. How much so? How can I understand how the husband's the head of the wife? Even as Christ is the head of the church and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, Reason, 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 conclusion. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands. There's another word there. A couple of words. To their own husbands in everything. Now I want to ask you something. Do you think, do you really honestly think that the reality in this country today, describes women, that this describes women as they actually live today. <clears throat> Why they don't? 
I probably in some places would never get any further if I got this far in preaching this sermon before a good many people because they just don't believe it. They just simply don't believe it and they're not going to follow it. But this is written to the church at Ephesus. It's part of the New Testament. It's written to us because it's part of the Lord's will for us. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, even as the Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. So it's by divine decree that man is to be the head of the woman as far as the church is concerned under the authority of Christ and in the home as God would have it. Now this headship rests upon two things. The original constitution of the sexes as God created male and female. But sometimes we forget sin changed a lot of stuff that I doubt we can even realize how radically sin changed the situation. We talk about man's fall and woman had a terrible part to play in man's fall in his sin and concerning the original constitution of the sexes the Bible teaches in Genesis 2 18 through 20 that the woman was made for a man now that ought to make you know if you throw anything else at me that ought to really get me that the woman was made for man not the man for the woman in 1 Corinthians 11, 8, and 9, Paul writing to the church said, echoing this, For the man is not of the woman, the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. If that's not taught in the home and from the pulpit, which can only supplement the home's teaching, and in the classroom, which again can only supplement the home's teaching. How can we expect our boys and our, especially our young ladies in this day and age to understand what a wife and a mother is and overall in general the role of a woman as God has assigned it? Same thing is true with the man. Concerning the woman's role in the fall, and this is where she differs, Eve does, from Adam. Eve believes Satan's lie. She was seduced. She was tempted. She believed that she would become as God. And hence, she was beguiled. She was deceived. If you look at 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, Paul harkens back to that. For he's concerned about the faithfulness of the Corinthians. And he says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in, that is in Christ. Obviously, in time, people were corrupted from the simplicity of the gospel of Christ because people fell away from the faith. But he likens it to Eve back in the garden. He doesn't say Adam did this because it didn't happen that way with Adam. Adam was not laboring under any kind of deception. A lot of people just read right over this and don't realize what's going on. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 14. Harkening back to Genesis 3 and verse 12. I learned this from the older preachers. Eve was deceived in the transition. She believed the lie and obeyed it. Adam just walked right in with his eyes wide open. There was no deception at all on Adam's part. I have even heard some preachers that never had really recognized that, the difference of how both of them came to transgress God's law and thus sin. And because of the woman's being beguiled by believing a lie and wanting to be like God and breaking God's commandments. Woman's subjection increased after the fall. 
I think you can read that in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. So that makes me say, I really don't know what the woman was like exactly before sin into the world. But the consequences that came upon her changed things a great deal because she was beguiled. She listened to Satan. She believed the lie. Now, none of the foregoing even hints that women are inferior to men. I've saved that to right now because when, when we talk about women being subordinate to men, automatically inferiority flies up. That's not true. Not true at all. Could be, but it does not necessarily follow. Are, are there any people here on the job who are subordinate to somebody else in the role you play on the job? Jonathan, are you subordinate to anybody at work? Somebody have authority over you? I could go through and start asking people all around, and you have somebody to whom you answer. Does that mean you're inferior personally to those people? Well, it doesn't mean that women are inherently more gullible either than men. But it does illustrate what happens when God's chain of command for society is broken. And that's the reason this lesson is being delivered, because it's under attack like nobody's business today when it comes to Satan. He knows exactly what he's doing and trying to destroy the home as God would have it, the very first God-ordained institution on this earth and the very core of society. It ought to be noted that as Christ's subjection to the Father involved no uh, removal of dignity from Him, that's the very point made by Paul to the church in Philippi in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. So there's none inherent in the woman's subjection to the man. Consider the role of Christ when he was in his earthly ministry. I do always those things that please my Father. My meat is to do the Father's will. And what does he say in the garden when he's sweating great sweat drops like into blood because of what lies ahead of him in a few hours? If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Now watch the subordination. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. We don't seem to recognize that. We don't seem to recognize that even in this country when it comes to the authority of civil government, when it comes to the authority as it is in the home, when it comes to the authority in the way God has organized the Lord's church. I have all my life trying to serve God as a preacher since I was 18, knowing a lot of folks and working with a lot of folks. And sometimes it felt like you were stumbling and bumbling along, though you were trying your best to do what the New Testament said. It was sort of like an old sheet sermon that J.D. Tant put up, and he used it wherever he went because people are people wherever you go, you know. And you can see a copy of it in J.D. Tant, Texas Preacher, it was like a wagon. He had a wagon on that thing. He put it up in front of the church building. And he usually put it up at the beginning of his meeting. And he might go a full seven days or two weeks or whatever. He'd be living with people. They might stay in one house the whole time, but he might stay in several different houses all the time. He was there, and he gets to know people pretty well. So he would have the tongue of the wagon where you would hitch your horses to and pull it, and he would have the wagon wheels and all these things. And by the time he got to the end of his time with them, he would then label those folks that were up in the position of the horses trying to pull the faithful workers in the church. But then he would also label people with big poles stuck in the between the spokes of the wheels trying to stop the wagon, the wagon's a church. Or he's got somebody falling off down on the side of the ditch over here with a jug in his hand. And he actually put names. Now he preached that sermon, he did it I don't know how many times, 
in a place called Locust Bio, which is across the Washita River from where I was born in Camden and raised. And then my first full-time work was 12 miles up the road in Hampton, Hogskin County, uh, from that place. And that happens to be the one that is discussed. And he mentioned some of the names of the people that I knew whose ancestors were in that. And I thought to myself, my, if he preached that there, I don't know whether I'd want to be in that building that night or not. But the point was, these things were stopping the church from being what God said the church to do. And it wasn't somebody off out here somewhere. It was the people in the church not doing what God told them to do. And a lot of times he would actually have faithful women up there where the horse is supposed to be trying to pull that along and all these folks fighting against them in various ways. Now I want you to look with me to 1 Timothy 2, 8, 8 through 15. Paul addressing this young preacher, he needed to have it in his mind, he needed to teach it to everybody where he preached the gospel. 1 Timothy 2, beginning in verse 8, I will therefore men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands out wrath and doubting. What does that mean? You be godly, truly godly, when you deliver prayers to God, and don't doubt. Pray on the basis of the truth. But then notice what he says. Is that is my prayer for the men in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Now imagine how far that would get you in today's world. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. I think that's about as crucial a text on the divine role of women as you'll find in the Bible. It offers a general statement of the will of God on the subject of women working with men in the church. Many try to limit the context to simply public worship, but there's no reason to do that. The scope is much broader. Certainly the instructions about modesty in verse 9 and childbearing in verse 15 are addressed particularly to a woman's perspective on her total responsibility to the Lord. And I try to see how well it goes over in churches today, and I'm talking about churches of Christ, when you preach on modesty and really get down to the nitty-gritty on what it means. And you'll find there's a big problem with that. Likewise, the comments about a relationship to male members of the body of Christ apply more than just to the worship assembly. It really is pointing out a state of mind or an attitude of a woman when she recognizes why she was created and why she was put here in the first place. Now, where are you going to learn that if, you're, if, you're, if the mothers don't teach it? In this context, we learn that women are not to pray publicly when men are present. That is, they're not to be the leaders or to exercise dominion or authority over the man. A leader exercises authority. They're not to teach when men are present. They're not to teach over a man. They're not to exercise authority over a man. They're not to usurp authority or exercise dominion over the man. However, I find that they are to teach men. How do I know that? When they worship God, one of those avenues of worship is singing. And the Bible says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. 
talks about teaching, doesn't it? And so she's teaching. Well, I thought she couldn't teach a man. Well, if men are in the assembly, she is. Well, what's her position? She's not exercising dominion over them. I'd hate to know that a husband trying to learn the gospel couldn't ask a wife who had good Bible knowledge the meaning of something. She'd have to say, if, she, if he asked her, well, what must I do to be saved? So I can't tell you. <laughs> you know, common sense does help. It's one of the rules of Bible study, rightly dividing the word of truth. When it comes to leading in prayer, that's directing people's minds in prayer, 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 10. So it shows a relationship. Men comes from the Greek word aner and has reference to males. Not mankind in general, male and female, but specifically the male of the species. Men are to pray in every place. King James says everywhere. Thus, when we engage in prayer, whether the whole church is assembled or a group of teenagers having a devotional, or a prayer of thanks is being offered at the dinner table, males are to be the leaders of the prayer. I sometimes say, I see people say, well, what about at home? Where are you going to train your children? And if you do train them at home, what are you going to train them to do? What the Bible said? Or something different until they get old enough? It reminds me of women talking about their little girls. Let them run around half naked and say, when they get old enough, we'll teach them what's going on. Well, how old is that old? Five? Eight, 10, 13, 15. Let them run naked till they're 15 and then tell them, shouldn't do that. They might just think enough to say, well, why have you let me do it ever since I could remember? Rear those children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Not wait till they get a certain stage and then say, they're old enough now to understand. Set the example. But then teach them as you go along according to their ability to understand. This priestly function, which is prayer is, is reserved exclusively for males when they're present with women because they're exercising dominion and leadership. Same thing's true of a song leader. Or people presiding publicly in a leadership capacity. Women are not to be placed in these leadership roles. Verses 11 and 12, I think, make that about as clear as it can be. I want to talk about that a little more. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor you serve authority over the man, but to be in silence. American Standard says exercise dominion over the man. It does not say you can't teach. It says you can't teach in such a way as to lead and to exercise dominion. As I said a while ago, if your husband were to say, what does this verse mean? You say, well, I know what it means, but I can't tell you. <laughs> You'd really be in subjection to your husband, wouldn't you? <laughs> Surely that's not the case. In a Bible class, a man's teaching it. And he asks a question to the class about a certain whatever in the Bible. The woman in the class, or a woman in the class, is not exercising dominion you know, over the teacher. He asks the question, what do you know about this? And she answers him. She's not exercising dominion over, but she may be teaching somebody else the class. She's not leading the class in describing or setting out how it goes. Now, I'll throw you one out there for you all to think about. You think it would be all right for the elders to listen to the women teachers? Or would by her teaching necessarily be exercising dominion over the elders as they see if you're teaching the truth? Well, there would be ways you'd go about that. One place I was at a PA system. And the elders were known because it worked very well in all the classrooms. Just go in there and flip up the switch and listen to what was going on. Well, they listen to women teach. When they listen, was she exercising dominion over that elder listening? No. She wasn't guiding him and exercising dominion over him. But he was listening to see if she was teaching the truth. And that was part of his job. So we need to do a little thinking when it comes to certain matters along this line, as to just exactly what's being said right here. And I'll tell you when it comes to the word silence, it doesn't mean total silence where you can't even make a sound when you take a breath. Now, if you go over to where Paul's instructing and correcting the prophet's wives, 
Because they were speaking up when the prophets uh, were uh, speaking. And he says, you ask your husbands at home. And he said, remain in silent. He used a completely different Greek word. And that Greek word means don't utter a peep while your husbands as prophets are speaking. You sit there and shut up. You will know something happened at home. I've heard my own brethren, preaching brethren, try to say that one is a comment on this and this is a comment on that. It is not. This is saying that a woman is not in her subordination to exercise dominion or direct the men. It's just what the Bible says. What else can I say? One fellow said, well, why? I said, it's just the way it is. How do you know it's just the way it is? I can read and understand. And evidently, God thought we ought to all be able to read and understand. So in this passage, it enjoins not the total absence of speech but a quiet life and a peaceful demeanor in which she fulfills the role God has given her. Thus, women, by the authority of God, are not allowed to be in a leading, guiding, or directing role in teaching or whatever in their relationship to men in spiritual matters. To do otherwise would be to put her in authority over men. Paul shows that this command is not cultural as some have tried to say thus with cultures it changed it is the way it is to be done in every culture regarding women when it comes to the role that God has assigned them 1 Timothy 2 13 through 14 it applies at all times and all places and not just to the time in which it was written in these two verses we have the reason for a woman's subjection to the man by creation Man has a natural position of authority over women in the church and at home. I didn't make it that way. You didn't make it that way. And when we're in subordination to those who have authority over us, as it is, even ungodly people recognize such as necessary things to be done decently and in order. And certainly the home is to be done decently and in order. Well, let's just close it down by saying... Women are not to preach or teach when men are present exercising dominion over them. They're to pray publicly when men are present, but they're not to exercise dominion. They're not to be leading. I hope when we have prayers led by men here, the women are praying right along with them. They're not to be elders and deacons then because of the very work of elders and deacons. To wait on the Lord's table, to lead in song are all considered to be positions of leadership. To usurp authority in the church or in the home in any way, contrary to what we've studied, is simply not acceptable to God. There's no, this in no way degrades the woman any more than Christ was put down or degraded when he was on earth and in subjection to his Father. Women have an important role in the church, important role in the home, important role in society but it's like so many other things there is a way that seemeth right unto a man but the end thereof are the ways of death that's not just applied to the gospel or to the church it's organization work and worship it's applied to the home also and it doesn't mean that all homes are always going to be the same way that depends upon a lot of the, the knowledge that's there and the dedication the faith that rises up but nevertheless, this is what the Bible teaches. And this is the way that a woman glorifies God. The way that a man glorifies God is to be what the Bible says a man ought to be. And that's part of his work. That is, to help her be what she ought to be. A lot of what men have done, and especially in this day and age, but it's always been this way, is make the role of women a much harder thing because they won't be what they ought to be. Now, that sets the stage for the role of men. And everybody's saying, be glad you get to that. But we will, the Lord willing. If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time to do that, to repent of sins, having believed in Christ, confess your faith in Christ, be baptized into him for the remission of sins child of God to repent of your sins if need if you committed confess them and pray God for forgiveness and we give you this opportunity now to do so while we stand and sing